Hi, this is Christian with Dark Portents, and today I'm going to be talking about Dancer's Lament, which I read last month, and I just haven't got around to uh, putting my thoughts on out here on the on video yet. So, uh, Dancer's Lament is the first book in the Paths to Ascendancy prequel series by Ian C. Esselmont. Um, it's a prequel to the novels of the Malazan Empire and the Malazan Book of the Fallen. It follows uh, the it follows the sort of origin story of Kellenved and Dancer, as well as uh, Dasim Ultor. Um, and or at least the first book follows Dasim Ultor. I'm not sure how much we're gonna see of him as the trilogy progresses. Uh, but definitely, it seems like the main characters of the Paths to Ascendancy are Kelimved and Dancer. And we get to meet Dancer before he uh, has his name. Uh, so his name is Doran in this first book. And he comes into the name Dancer through the course of the book. Um, now this... This will be mostly spoiler-free discussion. Uh, I'll, you know, mention a couple things about the characters and about the setting, uh, but try to keep it, you know, mostly spoiler-free as far as, like, plot stuff goes, and then get into things more in the spoiler section, uh, and I'll give fair warning before I jump into spoilers. So, uh, first of all, I loved the characters. Uh, I, I, it was cl pretty clear from the beginning of the book that uh, that Doran, or Dancer, was our main character, especially knowing like where he ends up from having read Gardens of the Moon and Night of Knives and um, other m books in the Malazan world. Uh, and, and, you know, like, so it did feel pretty obvious that Dancer and Wu slash Kelimved would be the main characters we'd be following throughout the book, and yet we still got this big cast of characters like you often get in epic fantasy with multiple POVs, and uh, it didn't feel like the other point of view characters got short shrift. Uh, almost never was I like, just get me back to the POV of the main characters. Uh, it felt like you know, each of the other characters that you meet was really well-rounded and fit into the world nicely and that their stories, for the most part, mattered. Um, uh, da -da -da, let's see. Um, maybe early on in the book, it felt like the, uh, the, side, the other main characters, not really side characters, but from the trilogy perspective, probably side characters, felt like they were... A distraction but then as you got settled into their point of view and learned what was going on with them it was a uh, it was fine um, the character I cared least about was this woman who worked for the uh, Itko Khan sword dancers which were like these uh, women who bodyguarded the Khanese king and they had these like flexible swords that they danced with which was really cool but her story kind of like felt a, a little uh i don't know a little slow and and you know i didn't have as much buy-in or investment in her in her character uh as the others but otherwise for the most part i uh I really enjoyed the characters um i felt like i could really Picture the city where the story takes place. Uh, the city take or the city that the that dancers lament takes place in is uh, Li Hang, and they did a really good job of like establishing like the flavor of the city, both in terms of like the like court intrigue and the palace and the like upper echelons of power, and in terms of like the criminal underworld and in terms of like the military situation of Li Hang. Uh, which uh, comes under siege throughout the course of the book. And uh, that's not really a spoiler. It's pretty well established early on that that's going to happen. 
Um, and, uh, you know, much like in Gardens of the Moon with Daruchistan, Li Hang had a, uh, had kind of a rooftop nightlife with the thieves and assassins, uh, or at least some of them, uh, having run-ins with each other on the roofs, and that felt really cool and cinematic. Uh, and it was all, like, really visual and visceral, like watching a film. Um, now, the setting... that While the setting was, you know, really, really well put together, it wasn't quite as uh, visceral and didn't have the same, like, pervasive, all-immersive tone of Malaz City and Night of Knives. So, uh, the, the tone and the setting were not as, like, perfectly enmeshed to, like, pull you completely in and pull you along. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I didn't quite enjoy, uh, the immersion and the tone as much as Night of Knives, but it was still really good, you know, uh, um, for for what it was uh not not Esselmont's best in my opinion but really uh fun to read and and to uh you know I explore this corner of the Malazan world um ch -ch -ch -ch. so the uh The pacing and the, uh, and the horror and the level of like horror present wasn't as, it wasn't as fast paced, wasn't as horror, uh, based, wasn't as thrilling as Night of Knives. Um, so, and the, and the, and the scope of the novel was much broader than Night of Knives. So it wasn't as like condensed. Um, so they uh there was a lot more breadth to the world building uh if maybe like a little less uh going in depth into like one location one event uh etc uh it flowed really well uh i really liked seeing what the world was like before the malazan empire was founded uh because kalimved founded the malazan empire and this is Kind of his origin story so it goes back way before the empire was founded and you have like warring city-states uh and sort of this like feuding kingdoms uh feel to the world which is a lot different than what the world looks like after the Malazan empire has established itself um and it was nice to see sort of what Mal the Malazan world was like before uh the warren of shadow was reawakened and people got access to it again so uh that was pretty cool uh definitely held my interest uh although having the main characters as characters where you already know where they're going to end up in future books can uh kind of uh make it a little less thrilling because you know they're gonna they're gonna make it you know they're gonna succeed you know where they're gonna end up uh, though I think Esselmont did a good job at not always making it predictable of how Dancer and Wu would get out of their latest pickle, what the cost would be, uh, and there was a humorous trope throughout the book of the characters continuing, continuously, like, failing upwards. So, like, they kept on, like, getting in over their heads, kind of feeling, like, you get the feeling that they're amateurs, uh, and there's, like, often a cost to their success, but since obviously they can't die because it's a prequel novel, you get uh, sort of like just like there's a state, there's stakes and a cost to their sort of failing and still progressing, or or you know failing having a setback but then coming back to it. Uh, so you know that uh, at, at first it was pretty funny, like it kind of rang pretty comedic. Uh, by the end, it got a little worn out, um, but, you know, may, that may be just me. Um, the, uh, this was balanced out really well by the other characters I didn't already know and wanting to see what ha happened next with them and not knowing where they were going to end up. It was cool to see a bit more about Nightchill, who's a character from Gardens of the Moon, uh, to um, 
see more about the Crimson Guard, which you don't get very much of in the uh, first few books of the Malaz and Book of the Fallen. You really only get, you know, a couple scenes about them and people talking about them, and like one scene where they're on camera in Gardens of the Moon. And, um, yeah. Uh, there was a little bit of inconsistency with the main character, Dancer, where, like, he would... Uh, make a big deal about like, oh, I'm slipping into a headspace where nothing matters, and it's only this moment, no past, no future. Uh, and then immediately after s establishing that that's what he's doing to try to succeed, he has a flashback to his past and like thinks about his past. And it's just like, okay, so we established that and then we threw that right out. Uh, I mean, is that Esselmont being inconsistent or is it just Dancer kind of like not being consistent and following through with what he establishes, not really sure, but it felt a little goofy. Uh, and then um, at one point in the book, Dancer's like, Doran is dead now. I don't go by that name. And then he keeps going by that name for the rest of the book. Uh, so <laughs> Dancer's a little bit all over the place as far as like he establishes something and then immediately doesn't deal with it uh, and goes back to what he was doing before he established that thing. Uh, and and it, it was kind of jarring. I'm not sure if this was intentional on Esselmont's part, and it's like an intentional inconsistency to Dancer as a character, or if it was Esselmont not following through with what he established. You know, I don't know, but it felt weird. Um... Other than those little problems, uh, the book was really cohesive. Everything went really well. There was lots of cool stuff about the Tyst uh, that I didn't know before. There's this really cool creature called the Man Beast Relandris, who like looms really large in the uh, setting of Li Hang, um, and that all fit, fit in really well with like the established world and the lore that I know from the other books. Uh, the relationships between the different factions and between people within. The different factions to each other all worked really well and the use of the concept of convergence which is this concept in malazan where power is attracted to power and uh the, often when you get like really climactic moments of different powerful beings or entities or factions coming together and their interests and powers colliding with each other or whatever or like a confluence of of events and powers like it's a convergence and it's like built into the world that characters know that convergences happen it's like a law of nature in the world not just like it's not like brandon sanderson where you have the sanderlanch uh which is like a an, an out of book concept of the way brandon sanderson handles climactic events uh the convergence is built into the Malazan world and the way that convergence was handled in this book was really cool as always i won't go into exactly why until we talk about spoilers or exactly how but it was awesome um and let's see ultimately i give the book four stars it wasn't quite as good as night of knives for me but i really enjoyed it and i really enjoyed seeing more of the Malazan world as always I'm excited to see where the trilogy takes us. I'm excited to reread this book after I've read novels of the Malazan Empire and Malazan Book of the Fallen in their entirety. Uh, and um, who would I recommend this book to? Do not start Malazan here. Don't do it. Uh, start with Gardens of the Moon or Night of Knives and uh, come back to this when you have a couple of Malazan books under your belt. Uh, if you're going main series after Dead House Gates, uh, is a good time to come back to this because a lot it, there's no spoilers for anything up to that point and you've already kind of like learned enough about Kellen Dead and Dancer and where they end up going and what they end up doing that it won't spoiler any, spoil any of that for you. Uh, so if you want, if you're a Malazan reader already and you want to check out uh, like a traditional epic fantasy trilogy that deals with the backstory of Dancer and Kelevid, I would say do it after Dead House Gates, or if you're starting with the novels of the Malazan Empire, after Night of Knives would be a fine time to come do this. Uh, yeah. 
not what I would recommend as like your first entry into the Malazan world, though I guess it would work. I guess it would work. Uh, just not my personal recommendation. All right, now I'm gonna go into spoilers. The Hounds of Shadow tearing shit up in Li Hang and in the Itkokani's camp was cool. I always love when the Hounds of Shadow come out and start tearing stuff up. It's great. Uh, the lizard-like creature at what I assume was an Azath house in the Warren of Shadow, that was really interesting and I want to know what that creature was uh, and what it was doing climbing up into the, into what I think was a floating Azath house. Uh, I really thought that it was ominous and interesting when the Azathani, a word I have not heard before, were communicating with Gothos at the beginning of the book, uh, especially if you uh, know where Gothos ends up in Dead House Gates. Uh, it's really interesting to wonder at uh, how he goes from being in this situation where he's in communication with the Azathani and where he's like doing his research like out off by himself in the middle of it kokan wherever and uh to that situation at the end of dead house gates uh i don't know i'm excited to find out if that's something we get to indeed find out uh and as far as convergences go the unveiling of Amtos felak as a way to try to break the siege by the jaghut that was working for the Kani's king Oh my gosh, so cool. Such a cool use of the magic system to sort of bypass the military situation, the impasse that had developed militarily between the Connies and the Li Hang. Uh, I really loved it. And then the way that this unveiling of Amtus Felek led to the Seeress doing the uh, ritual of the Tyst Leosan to have the like... Uh, blinding light basically nuclear uh <laughs> uh weapon just like burn all of these soldiers away and kill hundreds of people uh just it was so cool and i liked how esselmont showed how using that kind of destruction and killing to uh defend the city and and, and end the siege um, and maim so many people and just cause all this destruction, change the relationship between the CRS and the citizens of the city from one of being loved by the people to that of being feared by the people. Uh, it was really cool. I really liked the uh, relationship between Relandris and the CRS. I thought that was really cool. Uh, and um, how, the, how Relandris was like, sort of trapped by his love for the CRS and had this deal where she would keep the planes clear of uh, of settlements and have, you know, trade flowing so that Rolandris could, I guess, kill people on the road. I don't know. Uh, and then he protects the city for her and, like, goes and attacks our enemies for her. Really cool. Uh, really cool seeing, like, how Kelimved was kind of, like, just this, like, amateur like experimenting and not really knowing what he's doing as he's reawakening the war of shadow and seeing like the big players kind of react to this like noob coming in and, and bringing shadow back into the uh into the deck of dragons into the game although we didn't see it necessarily come into the deck of dragons yet like that's probably where it's going and uh what else um oh seeing that it's not just malazan sappers but all military engineers that are a bit cracked and defiant of authority and so forth. I love the trope in the Malazim world of the wisecracking, slightly crazy, defiant of authority, irreverent military engineers. Uh, I love that about this world, and it was n a nice touch to uh, get to meet one of the engineers from Li Hang and see her a reverence towards uh, the city mage, uh, and yeah, this and and the stuff about like the difference between the uh, Thire Warren and the like higher the like hold of light that's like higher than that that mortals shouldn't have access to, and seeing a mage like force himself to access the hold to get more power, 
ah, oh, the stuff with the magic in this book was just so cool. And I think I'm going to leave it there for about 20 minutes. Uh, and I'm going to upload this video and go to work. Dark Portent signing off.